Okay, welcome back to the Shop Class Podcast. Tonight, we got a special guest, Thomas Nicholas. And uh, he is uh, Nichols. Sorry, is that how I say it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he is a new teacher, but he's on a fast track. Like, he's going from student 2020 teacher, teacher, like the fall? Are you starting in the fall? Quite, quite possibly. I haven't been given the position yet, but it's very, very likely. This is amazing. And, uh, and because there's a shortage of teachers and whatnot, we're going to get into this. And the teacher that you had is here in the house, Matt. Bloomquist. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, and we have got a nice round table. Go ahead, Timmy. Sorry. I'm sorry you had Bloomquist. <laughs> it wasn't all bad moments. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a good round table. We got Timmy. We got Duke. We got Nick. Matt's here. And we got a new person to the podcast, Noah Hughes. And he's actually starting a new position coming from industry. This is actually interesting. You got two new teachers in the house. One of them brand new. The other one been to the industry. But either way, it, they're new to new to teaching. Both of you guys, Noah and Thomas, thank you for taking a chance and going into teaching. We need you guys. There's not enough uh, shop teachers out there. Cool. Yeah, thanks for thanks for uh, letting us in on this. Absolutely. This is so the shop class podcast is a place where we share ideas. You know, we found that when you're teaching, you're kind of like in a bubble. Uh, you know, there's not that many conferences to go to. There's not that many much information out there. So we started talking to other shop teachers, and it just grew. Um, we've talked with shop teachers from around the world. Pretty cool. So to get started, um, let's just uh, let's just talk about uh, Thomas here. Thomas, uh, my the number one question I ask every guest which I already know the answer to is, did you have shop class? So I did. Was, yeah. Who was your shop teacher and what did you do in shop class? So my freshman year I had, his name was Wes Amer and he is now the principal of the Capital Area Career Center in Springfield, Illinois. And I had him freshman year for intro to industry and we just did like, little woodworking projects, small electrical projects, just the basic stuff. And then Matt came in my sophomore year and took what Amer had and just blew it up. We started framing walls for Habitat for Humanity and then doing, we remodeled the wood shop my junior year. And then my senior year, we started the house building program again. And I was a part of that. And it just, it, what, what Amer had started and tragically due to funding had to minimize, minimize what he had. Um, Matt was able to just blow it back up to what it was and make it even better. Oh, that's so awesome. So wait, was Matt, was that a restart? How many years ago was that? Uh, yeah, we, it was a relaunch. We, we had the program back from like 69 um, to, oh, just a few years before I, uh, Thomas and them started high school and they put it on pause as far as the house building program went. And then we did the relaunch in 2019. So Thomas's uh, graduating class was the first seniors of the group to redo it or to start it all back up. And so I didn't realize that. So uh, how many years have you done uh, the house building project as the, as the restart? So we started 29. So th this is our third year. We're almost through our third third year of the house building program and on the second half of me teaching, which we'd be a little bit farther, but of course we know how all the last couple of years yeah. have gone. So. Yeah. Dude, it's been amazing. So I'm just showing here, you know, that they actually just in case someone's new to the audience, that it's amazing. Matt actually builds with the students like a full house, you know, from scratch. So Thomas, were you a part of that? Did you get to build some of the, you know, some of that house? I was a part of. That's a picture of the second house that they've done since the relaunch. I was a part of the first house, which is that one there in the middle there. Yep. Oh, no kidding. I was a part of that one for my senior year, and then I went and helped a couple times after that. Just whenever Matt was working there by himself during the summer without students. 
Wow, no kidding. That's awesome. I've been following along, and uh, uh, it's pretty amazing. I remember the, um, the Matterport uh, walking around the house. That was really cool. Yeah. I'm just going way back into the, uh, into the Instagram here. Um, pretty cool. That is awesome. So uh, what a cool experience. I mean, man, imagine building a house as your shop class. That's such a cool thing, right? Yeah, it, it was pretty cool. It was a good experience. Now, uh, so then you graduated, and then now where did you, where, where'd you go after that? So I went to Lincoln Land Community College, which is just the, the area community college. And they have a construction occupations course, which just covers the basics of carpentry, plumbing, electrical. Actually, Matt's my plumbing teacher this semester, too. <laughs> um, blueprint reading, along with... You can, uh, you can get a 15-month certificate or a two-year degree, and I went ahead and got the degree, so I had gen eds as well. And then I've also been taking some business classes just to go along with it. That's a good idea. Um, so the, the uh, Lincoln Land, is it specifically teaching you to be a shop teacher, or is it just construction trade? No. It made, it's made to prepare students for an entry level trade job, whether it be any of those that I mentioned. I mean, it, it's not made to be, it's not designed for teaching teachers to become a teacher. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause there's just not that many programs. They even offer that as an option. I didn't take that. I did alternate wrap. That's pretty cool. And is this it right here? Yep. Workforce career training? Yep. They actually have a green building that all of the workforce career trainings are taught out of. Nice. Oh, look at that. They got this looks like a jet engine or something. <laughs> they have they have airplane mechanics, welding, they have an HVAC system, a lineman program. Um they have auto mechanics. They used to have auto body shop, but they closed it down. Okay. But they still have the auto mechanics program. Nice. And uh, did you get a chance to do uh, welding or was it mostly uh, house construction? And so I actually, I start welding next week and then I oh, have no a kidding. summer class in welding. Yep. Nice. That's awesome. That's great. That actually sounds pretty good. Um, that's awesome. Uh, so, um, that's pretty cool. And now, so how, now how can you be a teacher? Is it because you have your two years associate and you're kind of like a permanent sub? Is that how they're doing it? I have, I have my two years associate and then I've been working part-time construction for four and a half years now. So for Illinois, you have to have your associates and then two years of field work. So I'll meet that. To be a nice. CTE certified teacher. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, cool. So, and then now, Matt, what's the position that uh, that he's looking into? So, Thomas will teach the classes at the high school that I taught before we moved over to the house building program. So, for sure, he'll be teaching intro to industry, which is kind of just everything, whatever you want to do. Um, we started a woodworking program that I believe they're going to keep. And so he'll have a he'll have a section of that, and then he originally we he was doing drafting and AutoCAD and 3D modeling, but I think they're going to have that combined into the engineering classes, and then uh, oh a barber check, all right, yeah, um, barber checks here. That way Thomas can learn from the real master here. Um, no, yeah, this is you, Thomas, the OG is in the house. You're so lucky. You've known, all right. yeah. yeah, yeah, you're very lucky. Um, but yeah, so he he. May not have to do, do he may not have to do the full blown uh, drafting and AutoCAD classes anymore, but uh, what we'll probably do is have him do a little bit of intros of those pro of those classes in intro to industry. Um, because the thing is, intro to industry can be a freshman sophomore, well, it can be in any grade level uh, elective, and we are very low on uh, electives for underclassmen. So. Um, they're, they're hoping to open up more entry, intro to entry uh, 
classes for him. And then because those classes actually feed into the building trades program. So he'll be teaching the prereqs that so he, he's teaching the feeder program to building trades. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. So you got the newbies, you got the young kids. Uh, did you say, I'm sorry, is it the freshman program you said? Uh, it can be any grade, but it's, it's uh, heavy freshman, sophomore. Oh, I see. Yeah, I have a similar situation. I have intro to engineering three sections and uh, mostly freshmen, but sometimes sophomores. And believe it or not, you get like a junior in there every so often because they didn't find out about it till later, which is okay. I usually try and get my – uh, advanced class filled with uh, juniors only because seniors they just don't care at that point and then they want to go home you know <laughs> you know yeah seniors it's an elective and they they're just there to run the yeah. clock out mm -hmm. uh this is cool all right um man this is wild so now uh uh noah let's see let's switch over to noah for a second uh so now noah you are not like two years out of high school this is you're in the trades for a while and you're going into back into teaching um what did you lose a bet or something like why would you do this sort of feel like it you know it's funny like this position to open up and um I have, it's a pretty good building community where i'm located and uh basically all the builders got together and we're like someone's someone's got to fill this position and they were like noah you know you talked about you know maybe changing careers and stuff and so i said you know what like i'll take an interview and it was like me thinking there's no way in hell i'm gonna do this and wow. not that I, I think it's amazing i think it's really cool i just didn't didn't see myself doing it took the interview and i was like you know what like as much as i complain about people not getting you know like i, I couldn't you know my subs and everything and employees and all like I couldn't find people to fill positions and I'm like and then some guy an older builder buddy of mine was like you complain so much about it like do something about it and I was like all right well I guess I will I don't know I'll do it and so wow. I just figured take the opportunity you know I really like my, the community uh, I live in it's a good community and I'm like hey this is this is pretty cool and a lot of the other like our CTE program uh, at our school is there's like seven or eight uh, programs and like all the other teachers are like really cool. And I'm like, you know what, if they're doing it, making it work and doing, you know, fun projects and everything like that, I, you know, maybe I'll just take the opportunity. And then, then, then I found Matt online and was like, man, what he's doing is what I want to do. And so I was like, if I can do oh, that. Yeah. And I, and in the interview, I said, as long as I can do what I want, and I think what's best for the industry, then then I'll take a job. And then they basically hired me on the spot. So it was pretty cool. Wow. That was the best soundbite that ever existed. This is the <laughs> advertisement for, for getting tradespeople to teach shop. Listen, no, you're not alone. I never thought I'd be a teacher. And if they had so if they had advertised the job in that way, I probably would have done it sooner. Right. Um, you know, but I tell you what, the thing is like when they opened, the, I went for an interview just to see, and when they opened the doors to the shop, it was like, Oh, <laughs> and there was like a car and a lift, the tools. And I'm like, so wait, can I like work on cars and customize cars? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, over here is the, da -da 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 -da. and I was like, wait, what? Wait, we just went past that, you know, like, hold on a second, you know? And so it's amazing because if you can run your own program, you really can, you know, get into it, you know, the, then it's not just a day job, you know, you can, you can really make something of it. Um, the other thing I want to say is how did you find Matt? I found him online. I was like, you know, I'd, I'd, kind of, I'd followed him before because he's, you know, he's very knowledgeable about um, well-built homes and energy efficiency and which in my industry is is something that like is desperately needed and it's gaining traction you know i've been in the industry for about 15 years and so the people I, and that it blew my mind that matt had all these connections and i'm like it's really it shows the importance of it because like there's well-known people 
that are associated with Matt that are realizing this too. And that's what I thought was really cool. I'm like, Hey, these, there's architects, there's industry, uh, you know, leaders, people in my world that I'm like, that guy's famous. I mean, they're, you know, in the rest of the world, people don't know who they are, but, um, so basically I had, I had come across them from following, um, other people. And I was like, man, this is, this is really cool what he's got going on. So not for nothing, but there's your answer of why to go online because we have to share. I mean, imagine if Matt stayed quiet about that program. Um, by the way, this whole entire podcast and everyone on here is connected because uh, Instagram and I started following. It was this cool teacher and he was doing something really cool. And he was like, he like this guy like took so, just a room and like really built it out, like organization to the max. And uh, and I was like, this guy's amazing. And I started following. And then he put up a sign saying, hey, donations go directly to this. I was like, bam, here's my money. And that guy is Matthew Barbachek, and he is on the podcast tonight. <laughs> Matt, it's been a while, right? Oh, my God. Say hi, man. What's hey. going on? Yeah. Wow. What an intro. Holy moly. That was, that's, that's, uh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, it's been a long time. I can't remember the last time I've been on. Um, I've been pretty distracted by a side project. Um, that's kind of what, what, uh, led to my initial disappearance and it's been keeping me busy, um, this whole time, which is good news really, uh, which means it's still going. And many of you guys are aware of that side project, um, which is, uh, called Capable Maker, uh, basically an online tool that'll work for shop teachers for project management of student projects. So, um, it's there's not nothing much like most of you have dabbled with what is public, and nothing much new has been done publicly. But there's been some behind the scenes progress on it. So, awesome. Hopefully, that, to hear. hopefully, yeah. Um. So. Matt, you know, he really broadcasted a lot with Instagram, and that's how we got connected. We started this podcast um, just on Anchor. It was literally a phone call, and we started the podcast, and then that led to just iterations, and, you know, we kind of changed it a bit, and then uh, we started doing, like, a weekly during COVID, and that, that became kind of the – weekly with a guest. That became the format we're at now, and then Matt's working on this – website that's going to help teachers so he got busy with that but the but the online community is huge it's huge um and it's only growing you know so uh and also so like duke and nick and tim like i actually knew tim from new jersey tech ed association but man it's much we're much more connected now that we're free from you know like the rigidness of a school or an association, they only have a certain amount of meetings per year. But the Instagram is like things are happening all the time, you know. Um, yeah, you can spy with what's going on in other people's classrooms, which is nice. Which yeah, is really, I, it is I really nice. You can see projects, you can see, you know, processes, you can see, you know, machines, you can see basically stuff that's going on that you weren't able to see before. Even if you were at a convention or a conference, you never saw that kind of stuff. Right. Totally. Which is neat. Uh, so, okay. So we, we can dive deeper on the Instagram stuff. Um, but probably the main thing that I would, I think is important for tonight would be um, just giving advice and answer questions on like, what would you do in your first year? You know, like between Duke, me, Matt, Matt and uh, Tim and, uh, and, and Nick, I, I think we probably have something to say about what we would do better our first year. Um, before we get to that, would you, is, there a, is there a direct que- is there a question you want to ask us? And if not, then I think we should probably go with the first question, which is like, what would you do better? What, would, what advice would you give yourself? Like, so I'll go around to everybody here and be like, hey, what would you do better the, the, your first year, you know? But let, before we get to that, do you guys have a direct question? Like, Thomas, you got a question about starting next year? So we, we can get into it later, but um, 
I I know I have a an idea for the intro to industry class. I I took that class and I understand what the process should be in that class. But I'll be the first teacher at our high school to teach a, a woodworking class. And I I have some ideas, but that's not really something that I've got I've explored a lot. That's something that I have questions about, but just about project ideas and how to get a group setting with students instead of just individual projects and stuff of that, I, that area. Okay. That's a good question. So, so, okay. Wait, say it was intro to trades you said, and then a wood shop class or those. Yeah. It's an intro to industry class, which is just covers basic stuff, shop okay. safety, tool safety, blueprint reading, stuff like that. And then and a wood shop then, class. A wood shop class. And you want to know what would you do in the wood shop class? Just kind of like, okay. And um, yeah. all right, should we hit that? Or Noah, do you have a direct question that you want to do? Yeah, how much, I, I think my thing that I'm trying to gauge and figure out is how much of your time did you spend like teaching and projects? Like those, like the differ, uh, like differentiating those two. And so basically that may sound like a stupid question and y'all can call me out. if It's a stupid question, but like, I'm trying to gauge, Hey, how much of my, how much of my time is that? Cause it's really for myself, it's extremely open-ended is what they, it would, is what kind of the parameters I have. So any advice on that? I'd love. Uh, okay. This is great. All right. So we got, what would you do in the woodshop class and like teaching versus projects and whatnot? All right, so and then we'll go to the round table. Hey, what would you do your, uh, better your first year? Oh, and then any other questions the veterans you guys come up with. So let's start with Tom. So with the woodshop class, I'll give you my two cents, but honestly, these guys are way better at that than I am. Um, I, I like destructive testing and com small competitive projects. So, um, you know, I used to do like, big projects and just try and catch up the skills needed for the big project. But that's, that's a big one to chew, you know, like, a, like a full car modification. That's what we were doing. And then I would just hurry up and teach them the skills to get there. That's difficult. And then I would spend the extra time after school with some kids. I would make like little team players and I'd be like, all right, you're going to be the welder. So I'll teach you welding. You'll be the machinist. You'll do it. But to be honest, that, that's like I spent a ton of time after school. So the way to get this in the classroom for me is small, competitive, destructive testing. Uh, so Kay Witt, who's not here tonight, Kevin Witt, you should follow him. Hey, by the way, Thomas, write this stuff down. And Noah, you might want to write it down. <laughs> yeah. Kevin Witt, he does a good um, – the first thing – that. He, he might answer this question better than I do, but one of the first things he does is rabbit joint versus, I guess it's called a, a butt joint or a pocket joint. No, it's a pocket hole. These guys know better. I'm not like the wood guy, but they'll do that and then they'll glue it or fasten it and then they on purpose crush it with a, with a vice. That's like one of the first things they do to show, really make it tangible. And kids love destruction. So, and then they do, and then he's got like a production line but it's not competitive. I would, I like doing small competitive. So that's my two cents about that. But I think these guys have some good stuff. Uh, who, who wants to go first here? Well, I just want to go on Ron's Ron, probably like for the wood shop scenario, you want to keep that room more structured, you know, pick one, maybe one for like an intro class, maybe one project, all those kids can do, but then bring like the design aspects of it, the destruction part into that CAD class because that class can be very boring. And so if you can design something and use the drawing aspect of the designing part, then build it and destroy it, probably that'll work in that CAD class rather than the woodshop. Got it. You got that, Thomas? Yeah. Is yeah. there... Is there another woodshop teacher at that school? No. I mean, I'm sure I'll be able to go to Matt with any questions I have or bounce ideas off of him, but well, it'll be 
there's there's two ways. So my I was going to suggest to you that if there was a, a second woodshop teacher there to model or just do what exactly what they do, you know, just I mean, immediately start with if they're doing a box, you do a box. If they're doing a table, you do a table, you know, model what they're doing and then get the feel of the projects. And then maybe a year or two out, then you start tweaking them and then tweaking them and then tweaking them. And then next thing you know, you're like, bam, now it's your own thing. And then that way it gives you a feel for the program. It gives you a feel for the equipment. It gives you a feel for the procedures, the processes, the movement around the classroom. It's all that, you know, I say geography that you got to deal with also in the classroom. Um, but since it seems like you're working alone by yourself, I mean, obviously you got Bloomquest as a resource. You have all of us as a resource. I'm primarily in a wood shop and I came in having other people that taught the classes. So I modeled what they were doing, but then, you know, you you need to find something that you're comfortable with starting then, you know, and then do that project before the kids even do it. Oh yeah. Like whether you finish it or not, like meaning like whether you sand to two twenty or you, um, you know, put a coat of finish on it or whatever, but you need to do the exact project based off the specifications you want the kids to do. So if you're having them do an in, an in, you know, a inlay picture frame, you literally do an inlay picture frame beforehand, show them this is what we're making, you know, and then go from there. Um, the other thing is while the kids are working on the project, you also work on a project. And if you have two or three sections of the same class, you do two or three projects until you are comfortable with that material. Then you get to the point, if you get to the point where now you're comfortable with material, you can wing it. But that's, that's definitely five years down the line. I mean, that's not something that's going to start tomorrow, but if, if the kids see you working and doing the project, it helps motivate them as you being a modeler in terms of showing them what the specifications are. Uh, you know, Timmy, I want to uh, give you a, like a check on that one. Absolutely. Um, I, I agree. I kind of like did exactly what the guy did before me for about three years. However, if I knew what I knew now, um, I, I would have, you know, like I would have. Uh, well, that's the next question. But but yeah, like you, you can also play it real cool like Timmy's suggesting. And now that I think about it, you got Matt right there. And honestly, Matt probably has a request, you know, like I would assume Matt's probably like, Hey, honestly, could you get them to do this, this, and this? And then you model a small project around that because you are the feeder to Matt's program. So I would assume that he's probably got something for you. Right, Matt? Yeah. Well, so Thomas has got two things good going for him. Obviously took my class. He's now, you know, potentially going to be teaching the feeder class that he took and understands what we're trying, our goals and what we're trying to do. The other thing is too, um, the teacher who taught the program I teach when I was in high school has been the one who's came in and became the fill in teacher. Once the teacher who was teaching the left. So, uh, Mr. Mathon is actually trying, is actually trying to get things set up for Thomas literally day by day by day. You come in, this is the project like him and I are practicing projects with the intro kids right now um, to see and get things set up. So he's going to have some kind of a blueprint to walk into. And then, and he's also, he's here in town, so he'll be a resource to pop in and help out. So he's definitely got that. And we are trying to make it as easy for him, assuming it's Thomas, which right now it's looking very good. <laughs> um, and then now on the, and so that, that'll be good for the woodworking side and the intro class, but also like you were saying, we have projects that we, you know, things that we want the kids to have a little basic understanding for when they get into intro. So there are some pod projects and stuff coming up uh, that we'll have Thomas do with the intro classes. The good thing is he knows, you know, when it comes to like the building science side of things, he, he has a basic understanding of this stuff now. So um, I can already have students coming in, understanding some of this stuff that we're gonna do. 
And that is the idea to have him you know, take care, do some of these mock-up projects to give them, you know, some insight and stuff. So yeah, Thomas, I'm not going to say he's going to come in. It's going to be just smooth sailing, you know, and we have every detail worked out for him, but we're trying, we're trying to pretty much recreate the program for him since we have a fresh start and let him a room to do what he wants to do, but he also had that kind of that, those, you know, guides the the sediment direction stuff. but yeah like i mean tim's advice was spot on i mean you know don't don't try to do it all in year one it, you'll, you'll kill yourself mm-hmm. yeah i think totally. i think a lot of first year teachers what they end up doing is they end up trying to think that they have to do everything you know they have to have a bang up lesson they have to have a you know every moment of every given period planned you have to have the ideal tool storage. You have to have all that, but you can't. And then as you work through the program, then you realize like, okay, well, you know what? I think I can make the room better by moving this here and then move it there, you know, the following year. And then feel, feel free, you know, to move it again if you don't like where it's at or relocate things to – makes your productivity in the classroom more efficient because that's what I did when I went to my new school. I actually changed schools in the middle of a school year and I was changing, I was changing equipment and moving things around while the kids were still in the classroom. And that helped me kind of establish number one, this is my room now. And number two, there's things changing here. Ooh, I like that, yeah. Timmy. Did it, but did it? Timmy's talking tough. But you can't do, <laughs> you can't do big changes. Like you got to do like little changes, like where the papers at, you know, like where the rulers are, like like little things like that. You got to start moving around because then, you know, because you come in with a organizational system that you know works good for you, but. Thomas isn't going to have that. He's not going to have that organizational system behind it. So he's going to learn that. Um, but being that I came from a, I came from one school to a new school mid year, the guy I replaced was a legend, and it was the kids felt like my takeover of the classroom or my introduction into the classroom felt like a hostile takeover. That's what it felt like. And by me coming in, they were intimidated because it wasn't the same old study hall work when i want don't have to wear safety glasses and then i came in and it was like oh crap this guy really wants stuff out of us so what do they do they rebelled and then i just kept on i just kept on telling i kept on being broken record you know hang with me you'll learn something hang with me you'll build good cool stuff hang with me you know you'll you know insert anything there you know if you just broken record they Eventually, one or two will catch on, and then once they catch on, then maybe three or four will catch on. But it takes a while. It's going to take a while. Um, this is awesome. You know, I, I really like this this topic because um, I feel like this is going to be a really good episode because it kind of reminds me of like, like even now, I'm not 100% happy with my classroom setup, my workshop, and Tim's like, move something, and I'm like, you know what? I should move something, you know, like you change up the scene. You're like, all right, you know what? We've got these, we've got these machines over here. Maybe I should move it. Or I got a car parked here. Maybe I should move that. That'll, that'll change things a little bit. You know, uh, it's not a bad idea. we got this bookshelf nobody's using. Maybe I'll move that a little. Um, that does sort of change things. Although I will say, I agree with what everybody's saying here. And especially what Tim is emphasizing, do not bite off more than you can chew on. And, and it's hard. It's hard not to do that. It's very hard not to do that because you're going to have mentor, teacher mentors following you around. You're going to have the principal. You're going to have your supervisor. You're going to have colleagues. They're, they're all going to be, I don't want to say nagging you, but they're all going to be watching over you and thinking like they're trying to help you. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the problem is that, yeah, they're trying to help you, but 
you almost kind of have to find your own way and then go back to them for help when you, when you know you need it. And, and the other big thing is don't get into a hole so far deep that now you're screwed. That's another thing like that. That ended up happening to me early in my career. And, you know, next thing you know, it was like, well, I'm stuck. I have no other option. I have to leave. Like, and then I left. Yeah, that was my first job. I had, I literally had to quit that job. Oh, wow. All right. We're going to get deeper on that later on. So, um, but Noah, I want to go to you for a sec. You had a question about balancing. And uh, that's, I think what's going on is that Timmy's emphasizing, um, you know, like, go into stages and it's okay to move things around. And that's why I was saying, Hey, smaller destructive projects. Like you can't fall in love with these projects. You gotta let the kids be competitive and come up with new ideas. Because one thing I'll tell you guys is that Thomas and Noah, you might already know this, but the kids creativity is like magic and it's underrated. The school system does not rank creativity as an important skill let me tell you they are amazing they're awesome so if if, 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 you know you don't want to make it yours you want to make it let it be theirs but you're the you're the guy you know so that's really good stuff but on that riff i just want to say no you're asking about teaching versus project so when i first started i don't know what you mean by teaching is that talking is that what you mean by that describing yeah, you know, it's, it's it's basically what I'm running into is this is I have like, you know, like I've been assigned a mentor and um, like you're like when you all are saying like, you know, like the principles on you on you, I, I have great administration. I really love them. And or at least, you know, you have to say that, right? Uh, uh, just just kidding. Uh, but like you have all these every everyone has their ideas and like everybody's saying, hey, make sure that they're actually teaching. And I think at the end of the day. It's a lot of people worried that like I'm just going to go in there and just do projects or and they're not going to actually sit down and learn anything or I'm going to you know go too heavy one way or the other. And so in my mind, I'm like, am, am I missing something? I'm the one that's not, you know, the traditional educator, I guess. So am I missing something? So I and missing? Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. So. Okay, I, think I'll, I'll tackle is, this. I think Matt is going to probably knows what I'm about to say, but go ahead, Matt. What do you got? Uh, well, I mean, obviously in this group, I'm one of the, I'm probably other than, you know, Noah and Tim, I'm, I'm the next youngest one here. I haven't been teaching as long as these guys, but uh, that was one, one thing I came in worried about. Uh, and even teaching the, the Lincoln land class with Thomas, like, I'm like, hey, you know, I'm always asking Thomas, hey, did we stay in class long enough? Do you think this is good? Because I haven't taught there yet, so I don't know what – it's hard to know what's expected of you, right? And what their idea is of teaching, quote, unquote, since not everybody will see that, uh, you know, what what's their definition of teaching? And one thing, at the prison, I like when I started off at the prison, um, by the time I got to high school, I had the confidence for it. But it's funny, I go to Lincoln and the confidence goes away. But uh, when I was teaching at the prison, that was the thing. It's like, what, you know, when my dean walks by, are, are, are they busy enough? Are they doing enough? Is this what they're supposed to be doing? What are they expected? Now, on the simple side of that, you just ask what they want. But I would suggest stick to what you want to do because if you ask, then they're going to expect you to do what, you, what they tell you. If you just take the reins and say, all right, this is what we're doing. They get, like for me. I don't have a lot of extra assignments. I'm just going to tell you, there wasn't a lot of extra assignments that went into the grade book other than the participation points of the actual program itself, building the house. So that's what I made the program about. This is, and when people ask, you're like, oh, well, you know, it, it reminds me I, in college, I did a capstone project. And my capstone project was I remodeled my parents' bathroom. And when I was talking to the graduation person, they're like, that's all you did was remodeled my parents' your parents bathroom i'm like are you kidding me i got like five stitches it was hot it was sweaty and dirty like are you kidding that's all i did i go because like you didn't, you didn't write a paper or something i'm like yeah i wrote a paper i said that was the easy part like here if you want the paper read paper like here, here and i documented every single day 
And my advisor told me, he's like, well, to make the school happy, you're going to have to do the paper. He's like, but the, the, the dean was blown away that I decided to do this for my capstone project. And it's the same thing. Like, I get what you're saying is like what the school does describe as you teaching. I would say uh, if they come and say, hey, you need to do more of this. Okay, then add it in. But right now, if your kids are all doing projects, because here's our thing, all of our students, and Thomas will tell you, he was just one of these students. Heck, we were these students. All, all we want to do is do stuff, right? right? Like, and that's learning. Like, all the other classes are trying to find ways to get their kids hands-on to do a math activity or science activity or English activity, whatever. We actually get to do all activities. Like, we get to go try to make them do written assignments, right? So our students don't want to mess with that stuff. So I just say, and if anybody else can chime in and disagree or agree, but for me, I try to stay away from what traditional school is as far as assignments go and stick with, hey, we're building projects because just like we were talking about, and I'm sure we'll get on this rant with the social media, you know, we have stuff that we can show the world what these kids are doing. So let's let them do. Like, like I said, you know, you and I were talking like, what's a math teacher going to do? You know, snap a picture and post on Instagram of a worksheet they did. You know, we get, we, you know, Tim gets to take pictures of the kids turning awesome bowls and uh, Barbara Jack's got kids making stuff for the econ and Nick's got kids doing stuff and Duke. So let them do it, man. That's my, there's my two cents. What do you got, Ron? I'll, I'll add on to that if I can. Yeah, um, go for it. From the, te from the student perspective, since I'm still in class, like, like Matt said, it was mostly participation points because I mean, we're building a house. We're not going to take a, a rain day. Maybe we'd go over something in class. But like when, whenever you're on a job site, you're not going to take a break to do chapter 14 of a carpentry book for, for points. <laughs> but at my Lincoln Land class, my, my first semester, I took carpentry one and it was all book work. And like, I know, I know some people can read a book, remember exactly what they read, but especially in the trades, that's not, that's not how one learns. I don't think anyways, I'm, I'm a very hands-on learner and I just think it's better to get the participation points and keep, keep the students busy. I mean, besides, besides carpentry class, which was my favorite class, even though my teacher's sitting right there, um, PE. Everybody likes PE because they're up moving around doing stuff. You're not sitting there doing book work. I mean, as much as as much as people don't think shop classes are a buffer for the rest of school. I mean, you go from doing a 10 page report in your English class to having hands on experience with construction. Like, I just think that the hand keeping and busy and hands-on is going to teach them way more than what reading a framing book is going to do. Like my favorite, if you ask a lot of students, my favorite part of construction is framing just because in such a short amount of time, you, you look back and you see what you've accomplished. Just like Blinkwood said, you're not going to take a picture of a piece of paper and post it everywhere, but you can take a picture of framing and everybody thinks that's cool just because you're, you're showing what you can do without having to read stuff or sit in class for 40 minutes doing a slideshow. Yeah. Um, I want to kick it around the room. Uh, but I, but you know, my, my quick, well, actually I'll wait, I'm going to wait to give you my, my version, but let's go to Barber check. Cause I got to tell you, Barber check treats this like a science. He's on it, man. So, you know, I mean, I, I now I puffed them up a little, but uh, but yeah, like I agree with you, Thomas, and I I, I would say basically everybody's kind of telling Noah error on the side of projects, but but there's more to it than that. I think everybody here agrees with that. But let's let's get some barber check in there. Go ahead. Uh, sure. <clears throat> yeah. So like direct instruction, I think is what you're like wondering about, like how much direct instruction versus project time and what's that ratio supposed to look like and it's going to vary with your audience 
some audiences you're going to want to do more direct instruction and then the project time some you'll do less and you just got to calibrate that and just kind of like get a feel for it um there the projects is definitely like higher that's where the higher value learning uh happens but you got you do have to get good at direct instruction a little bit um especially in like a you know the woodshop class where like i think in woods like quality shows up more in a woods class than like an engineering class and what i mean by that is like if a student does sloppy on an engineering project it just looks like a sloppy like that's what engineering is kind of supposed to look like right a little bit sloppy but like i struggle with my woods projects coming out like like tim does a good job he's got some eye popping pieces that his students come out my students kind of get like the sloppy engineering defects showing up on the woods projects which is experience don't beat yourself up when the quality is not where maybe it, it won't be where you want it probably the first three years maybe um and you can't hold you can't beat yourself up for it um or you got to celebrate it like it's still something to celebrate but you're going to want to push that envelope and so the um that getting back to like that ratio though it'll just vary uh a little bit and You'll want to like one thing I find really helpful as kind of a direct instruction tool is defining success criteria. So when we're talking about that box, what makes it an example of an advanced project? Uh, and in, in my ideal world, but this is this is an example of what the guys are talking about, about how you'll imagine way more than you can do in reality. And so do not hold yourself to your imagination standards. It's impossible. I mean, it just, it is. I mean, use your imagination. You'll, you'll enjoy it, have fun with it, but recognize it as a, as a projector of impossibilities, you know what I mean? Like, and then pick the yeah. parts that are possible and attainable because um, it'll be hard not, it, it just, but anyway, so, so looking at that projection, like I would love to have like basically five demo pieces of each project. This is very advanced. This is a beginning level project because because then the kids can see and reflect because they're not all going to do advanced, you know, and you do again, you want to celebrate their progress, even if it is like a beginning level. But then they see the success criteria. They can reflect on it. It's it's very objective success criteria. It's not, oh, this project sucks because Mr. Barbertech doesn't like it. It's like, no, it sucks because when I compare it to the beginning project, it's worse than that. So maybe not five, but three or two, you know, the idea of building a project before the students build it um, is a good idea. You're going to be time constrained, but here's my advice. Use that handicap to put yourself truly in student mode because you're more experienced and you know, you have baby steps automated that, that you don't even know like someone can mess up because... It's, it's like explaining to somebody how to breathe some of these baby steps for you. Because once you have some experience, and even if you don't, if you're not heavy in the content area, you're still just good with your hands. You still have like mechanical intuition. You still can feel how a tool, the feedback from a tool, your students won't have that. And you'll struggle to articulate some of this stuff because you'll explain step one, two, and three. But what they need to hear is step one and then step one A, step one B step one C, step one D, you know what I mean? And that's, and you're not even aware you're doing A through D, you know, you're not even aware that you're doing that. So a good handy, like you're going to be time constrained. You're not going to have time to do all the projects that you want to do. You want to whip out these demo pieces. Well, use that time constraint to your advantage to put yourself in student mode. So what I'll do is I, before I knock out a project, I give myself like, all right, I think if I was to sit down and do this project seriously, it'd take me three hours. I'm going to force myself to do it in an hour. And what that does is it puts me in a teenager of mindset because they're, they're just not going to be as passionate about, you know, the majority, you know, depending on your population, but a lot of them probably won't be. And then, so you like realize like, Ooh, students are going to be tempted to do this to rush a project. So I need to be aware of that, that like hack that they're going to probably try and do because I'm trying to do it right now as I try. And then you've got a piece that you can show is kind of like, here's what you don't want to do. Um, and it's a good time to model like making mistakes and owning mistakes as well. Cause you're going to combat that for sure. Um, where, you know, like what are the, 
but I'm sure Tim's heard all the excuses and everybody else in here too. You know, like, you're like, no, you'd really need to like sink those screws flush. It looks like crap that they catch fingernails or, you know what I mean? Oh, I think it adds character, you know, and, and all of a sudden they're a stylistic uh, expert. Um, yeah. Yeah. They're going to give you excuses for why they don't want to do it. Yes. And so <laughs> I, I, I like it that way, or I think it looks good or, that was part of my plan when you yeah. flat out know that that was never part of their plan and they're just doing it because they're lazy or because yeah. they don't want to go back. They don't want to go back, take the screw out, re pre drill the hole and then put the screw back in. Yeah. Right. So, and, and it's like, you can, you can react to those things or you can prepare for those things. And that's why I'm telling you, put yourself in a student mode because if you're prepared for it, you can mitigate it a lot more effectively once it's already happened you can be reactive to it and there are techniques for that too but um that's uh and then as far as as far as wood shop instruction goes like because um it's a little mess or it's a little i think i want to say higher risk than engineering or, or like an engineering type project in the sense you know what i mean you got tools you got more money and materials again that showmanship needs to show up otherwise it's like you, you end up making this crappy family heirloom that mom and dad like want to hide. Um, because of that, like you will want to uh, standardize your projects to a degree and say, all right, we're all doing this birdhouse, which I used to be pretty against because, because I, I am more on the engineering design and creativity side. What I've learned from doing woods is if we can all do kind of the same project, I can actually kind of manage that creativity a little bit better because we're not i'm not spread so thin managing you know, just kind of too much so uh, but then within that if everyone's doing a napkin holder or whatever think in your head or prepare ahead of time maybe like the level three difficulty of that napkin holder and then have a level two and a level one maybe you teach everyone level two but you got a student who's absent a lot or or students with disabilities or someone you need to accommodate and, and you make a level one mod modified version of that project available to them. And then you make a level and then, and then you got the student who's about to finish two weeks early. So you go ahead and have a level three kind of modification and you sell it as like prestige. Like they've unlocked the hidden level of the video game. Um, Cause otherwise it'll just look like extra work. They're like, Oh, I've, I've, I, you know, I'm doing good and I'm punished for doing extra work by, by getting extra work. So that's my, that's my wood shop instruction advice. That's cool. No, that's good. I mean, it's kind of, you know, obviously it's hard, you know, Matt's kind of been working on this as like, uh, you know, all of us in here are kind of like Matt and that we, this is a career that we're very into, you know, and we're willing to ask questions and share ideas and whatnot. And it's going to take time, you know? So, yeah. So that was like a big download, but he's right. You know, you got to kind of like, um, you know, have your standardized stuff and your experiments, you know, kind of thing. Um, so we're going to jump to Duke and Nick. Uh, yeah. What do you guys think? What do you think, Duke? Well, if you're going to go on the internet and look for projects, just bypass that. Go right to Instagram. I know we're going to talk about Instagram <laughs> later on too, but we already proved it. Really? We already proved this. In an episode of a uh, shop class podcast, you know, you never know what to type in industrial arts, you know, oh, projects, yeah. technology, education projects, uh, technology and engineering projects, um, schools. We, uh, you know, we did this once on the podcast and uh, we couldn't find many projects at all. And then we looked on Instagram you know, and the project, you know, you, you do a couple of hashtags or you do a search for certain projects and they start popping right up. And that's something. Hey, dude, what episode was that? Oh, I don't. OK, I don't, I don't remember. Oh, you know, it was Capable Maker. I'm oh, sure. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yep. so it's so yeah. funny we're talking about this. Barber Check's working on a, a, like a, you know. It's like a website that helps you where you do pick. You say, I have this much, this, this many tools, this much time, this skill level, and boom, it gives you project suggestions. It's actually pretty cool. So he's working on that. It's kind of like 
boom, this is capable maker right here. You know, it's like unbelievable. Sorry, dude. Go ahead. Yeah, that was no, that's all right. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's but really it's true. Um, we candidly went to go look up projects. It was like impossible. And then we went on Instagram and bam, you just got like so much on there. Yeah. Okay. God, dude. Sorry. Yeah. And a lot of times you'll run into, you know, your safety, your, you know, the rules of safety and you have to do the safety tests and stuff like that. And it's always, it's always boring for the kids. So you somehow try to make it exciting. So then you even go to like the International Technology Education and Engineering Society of America. And you figure that they would have, you know, the, the best, you know, shop safety lessons tests and videos <laughs> do yourself a favor and make your own video because the ones they some of the ones that they have like they're the announcements for like afternoon dismissal is in the background and then every kid starts giggling in class because it's from another school so do yourself a favor and make your own videos if you're going to go that route you know because you are teaching it repetitively um you know, most of the stuff I try to do on my own, but I like to show stuff that comes from the uh, International Tech Ed Association. But uh, sometimes it just doesn't work. So it's better off, you know, it's better off doing it yourself because you're going to spend so much time wasted looking to find something else on the Internet. And, and, and basically, and a lot of the times you're going to be tweaking it for your own classroom anyway. So just... Take ideas from somebody else, but do it yourself. Yeah, totally. Cool. Yeah, this is, that was that was actually good, dude. Get jog some memory. I wrote down some ideas for later. Uh, Nick, what do you got, man? I think we're basically the the premise still is teach, teaching time versus project time, and what are some good projects to start with. So it's kind of a combination of of Thomas and Noah's uh, question. What do you think, uh, uh, Nick? You guys really did cover it all. I mean, um, I know myself when I first started, I had these grand plans and try to implement them and you, you fall flat or it, oh, okay, I guess a, a few week project in your mind is going to take six weeks and, you know, so start small. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, so just to kind of, uh, you know, add something or to the end of the book and that one, um, some, I would say to Thomas and Noah's, especially Noah's question about like teaching versus projects. I actually think the less I say the better. So, so I, I treat my students like as if they're spies, they're, they're on a need to know basis. If, if you give a teenager too much information, it's it, they're just gonna like zone out, especially new teenagers. Like the one, the generation coming up, they're not interested in listening to me talk about stuff. Um, so someone would say, "Oh, but like I even had one kid say to me, like, why 'Why don't you, why don't you teach?'" And I'm just like, "I'm not really a teacher. I'm like a guy that's like building stuff. I, I build stuff with you guys. How's that?" And they're like, "Oh, okay, you know." So. Yeah, I I would like the whole idea of like a lecture with like a bullet point, like don't even bother, dude. Save your energy, man. You know, like just forget it, dude. Just get to work. You know, I, I like I go up and I'll be like, all right, this is what we're doing. And I grab a megaphone now because I don't want to kill my voice. It's like, all right, this is what we're doing. All right, go. That's it. What what they're like, what does it do? Like, it says it right there. Friday, let's go. You know, just get to work, you know, and if you've done it before, like, like Barbara Shack was saying, you already know the questions they're going to ask. Now, look, I know you're going to ask, where's this and how do I do this? I'll show you right now. Okay, cool. You know, and so the less talking, the better. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, you, you know how kind of like, you know how like uh, Noah was talking about this and Tom, Thomas didn't mention it, but it's probably on his mind, like, you're thinking people are watching you, so I have to fill, I have to fill, I have to fill the bucket. The bucket is the teenager. So like, I'm gonna put this in, I'll put this in, and they probably need this. And the, the principal probably wants this, and they want safety, and they want this, and they fill the bucket, fill the bucket, right? 
that's not how human being work. Human beings don't work like that. Human beings are closer to like a campfire, right? You need to break off little tiny pieces and put it there, make sure it's dry and prepped and the environment's good. Try and get that lit. If you could get that lit, then take the bigger piece and put it on there. If that stays lit, then you could take the bigger one. Can you imagine if you had a campfire and you were like, they're going to have this and they're going to need this in the future. They're going to need this a, a bigger log in the future because whatever. No, they're not. No, they don't even know what the future is. They don't know what you're talking about. You're going to smother them. So you got to start with a campfire. Matt's got his hand up. Go for it. You, 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 you made a good point that jogged my memory for something. Thomas, I don't know if it, it may have been, it may have been in morning class that, I had my evaluation. So Ron was, you know, you said you got the people watching you do this and you know how you, you only give them the information you need. So my, well, actually the last two evaluations we had because of COVID, we haven't done any evaluations. I literally for my, the, the part, the part, hold on a second, my five-year-old. Go ahead, Matt. You got it. Um, yeah. So basically, yeah, you, you don't want to smother them with too much stuff. Okay. Oh. You know? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's not parent age. Tell Lydia to leave you alone. The older ones are bugging the little ones. No, it's this many. Yep. Okay, go. All right. Uh, anyways, on my evaluation, all I did was, for one of them, I showed the kids how to install an outlet. It, it took me five, eight minutes, and then I said, okay, go. That's all I did in front of the, the principal for my evaluation. The when the Perfect. vice principal showed up, when the vice principal showed up, we installed the window. That probably took us 15 minutes. And I said, okay, everybody go. Go do your windows. So I literally quote unquote taught for my evaluations for a com of my both evaluations that semester, a combined of maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And that was it. And then the rest was go do it. Cause here's the thing, the kids, they, they, you know, you're supposed to teach the kids so they can do something, right? Well, okay, I just showed them and now they get to go watch the kids do what you said. So I either taught them really well, and now they know how to do it or I didn't, but then I could go help them when they had questions. Worked well, out great. great. Well, Matt, well, you can, all, Matt, you can also, you, you know, you also prove your, your, yourself as a teacher when the kids are able to work and you don't have to you know be the referee and put out fires and also while the administrator is there that gives you the time to talk about your program as well what 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 you're doing how you got to that point and you know where you expect it to go in the future yeah one thing to, one thing to think about when it comes to that direct instruction versus like project time ratio is you might want to fall back on direct instruction occasionally as a energy management tool. So if if your projects have are starting to get off the rails, your students aren't giving you giving you a lot of self sufficiency. So you so you're responding responding to Mister 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 Mister, and and you are just getting exhausted. Or like just recently, I got to a point where my students were just dark and, and whiny and complainy no matter what i mean i could have had puppies and ice cream and they were that way and some of that's normal but this was worse than normal and um non-punitively like i didn't sell this as a punishment but i was just like i knew my own energy couldn't keep investing in shop style energy if there was going to be no like z like negative gratitude and appreciation right like i'm okay with zero but this was this was toxic. This is getting toxic. And so just non-punitively, I just said, you know what? Um, we're going to write donation request letters for the next couple of days, which was an authentic need for the shop. Um, and just something I wanted to just do with the kids and get off my checklist anyways. Well, that gave me a little bit of time to recharge my, my shop maintenance battery. And then it also like the kids came in and they're moaning and groaning about writing these letters. 
But now I can say, all right, we're going to go back to the shop. And they're like, oh, thank goodness. You know what I mean? And now the moaning and groaning is gone. Their batteries reach, like their appreciation batteries recharged. My shop maintenance battery is recharged. So I would keep this tool in your back pocket, this direct instruction tool, um, just as a way to kind of say, you, you know, um, recharge your batteries occasionally. You can find authentic things to directly instruct. Um, and, and I would recommend at least making it authentic and, and just every now and then just to recharge their, their appreciation battery and recharge your, your shop maintenance battery. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a tool that you may want to leverage. Yeah. That's good. Uh, Glad go you ahead. said that. Barb, check. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, so just the other day, we, I was doing the same thing. Like whatever it was, I don't know. Same thing. Kids were just getting edgy. It was people were cranky. I think I was getting worn down. And I was like, all right, guys, you know what we're doing? I took a few kids that were still going good. And we worked on the project we had to take care of. It was pretty minor. I think it was something in the garage and drywall. The other, the rest of the kids, I divided up and I had them pull everything out of the tool trailer, get it cleaned up, organized, straightened up. Had them go into the mobile classroom, do the same thing because it, it was a disaster. Pull everything out, clean it up. It was a nice day outside. I said, you know what? Let's get, we got certain kids away from each other. I was like, it was a no thought day. Oh, he might have froze. <laughs> oh, that, was good. that was good sound by that no thought but, day. <laughs> but along, along those along those same lines, you know, uh, you know, as shop teachers, we're always part of the, you know, extended projects, the ones that take, you know, more than one day. But you always want to have a one day project uh, to do. They're gonna something's gonna happen. You're gonna have a snow day. They're gonna extend the marking period. You thought you were done. The kids aren't done, you know. They you need a one day project. Even like uh, Barbacek said, maybe uh you know the kids are in a weird mood. Something's going on. You need to just say time out. We're doing this for one day, and then we'll pick up what we're doing tomorrow. Yeah, that works. Believe it or not, I actually, you know, I don't want to waste time and get them. I don't, you know, you don't want to get them in the habit of like you'll just do whatever, like movie day or whatever. But, you know, listen, I, you're not a machine. You're a human being. And so hey, we had a really nice day out and I got this oversized freshman class and like, they're like, hey, can we go outside? And I was like, and I'm like, no. And then I was like, what? Uh, you know what? Like, let's just go outside. <laughs> so, we went, you know, I was just like, what are we doing? We went outside and I stood there, I'm like, there's no way that like a taxpayer would want me to be a shop teacher and just let this and just let this class outside. They're running around playing tag, just making it up, just making up games. And I'm standing there going, I can't believe I'm being paid for this. But no one said anything to me. And I'm just like, hey, you know what? And when the next day we got back in the shop and the first question is, hey, we're going outside. And I'm like, absolutely not. No, you got your day. That's it. Yeah. Now we're working. And they're like, all right, fine. You know, you know, but like, they're going to push it, but it's okay. Every so often, you know, type of thing. I think we lost him as well. Oh, there he, there he is. Um, so uh, we covered. No, I, I'm, I'm here. here. I'm oh, here. there we go. Good. Okay. Um, so we covered a lot of that. That's pretty good. I think you're getting the feel, you know, kind of feel. It must be funny, Thomas. Are you are you laughing at us, like listening to shop teachers? Since you're you're the closest one to being a student, like, are you, is this funny to hear the insight, the, the behind the scenes? Like, what do you think of all this? It, it's exactly what I thought it would be. <laughs> I mean, a little bit of a little bit of knowledge with a lot of bit of humor. <laughs> yeah. Listen, you, you could call we don't nobody knows what they're doing. We're just trying our, our best, okay? You know. Um well, I thought there's there's no for it. It's kind of your like you said, you're kind of on your own. I mean you can't yeah. go ask other can't go ask a math teacher how how to teach a shop class. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think 
to answer um, Noah's question, teaching versus doing, I would say doing more. Do more. Um, however, um, when it comes to doing more, also when it comes both of them, teaching and doing, you never want to try. This is like a warning. I don't know. This is kind of like another another segment. We're shifting gears. We're going on the next level now. Um, actually, I should go around the room, ask for everybody's best warning. But my um, the best warning would be: don't try and push the elephant up the hill. This is not going to happen. The elephant has to walk up the hill. You can guide it. You can you can kind of like so like for instance when it came to you asking about teaching and teaching you know quote unquote. I would never try and convince a class to do something. I'll just lay it down. You know, lay it down and here's what we're doing. Um, and then the same thing goes with doing. If they're not doing something, it it's it's like a big punch to the ego but if they're not doing something it's kind of your fault you know you got to kind of think like what what can i do to make this work to spark the fire it's almost like like i had a campfire here and i threw a log on there and i was like oh i know it i don't have any kindling so i'll just throw gasoline on it you throw the gasoline on the kindling on on the large log it doesn't matter it goes out it doesn't matter how much lighter fluid you got, or not gasoline, but lighter fluid. I threw the lighter fluid on there. It put it's out. It sure it flashes and then it's out because you didn't build it up, you know. So I would say don't try and uh, force it, you know. And 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 that comes with like that's energy management, like Barbara Check was mentioning. Um, uh, let's see. So let's go around the room. Um, Actually, do you have any questions, Thomas and, and Noah? Okay, let's go around the room and talk about the next question. Um, yeah, well, big, let's get into well, – you know what? We'll save the biggest warning for later. Let's save that because that, that could get, like, negative because it's kind of frustrating, to be honest. Like, teachers get frustrated. Okay, so we'll leave that for a little later. Let's do um, I want to I want to mention about making your own content. Uh, making your own content, I think, is very important. And who said that? Um, Bloomquest said that or Barbacek said that? Duke. Duke. Duke said Duke it. Said. Okay. Sorry, Duke. So make your own content is super important. And the reason why is because um, if you go to find like a video, like let's say Across the room, the kid wants to use drill press. You might not have the time. Uh, you might not have the time to teach that person, but you know you need it done. And you're over here. And you can't be in two places at once. If you had a video on how to do that, you could give the kid the video. And believe it or not, if the video is done well, you might be able to just watch from across the room and the kid could operate drill press without getting it wound up or something crazy. So, and why make your own content? Because the kids know you. So you are basically a celebrity in their life. They know you. And so if you show them some other video, they're going to be like, yeah, whatever. Unless it's some amazing video, you know? So I would say make your own content hundred percent. Yeah, Duke. exactly. And to save time doing that, starting out, here's what I recommend doing you're going to demonstrate drill press safety, have a kid record that demonstration and you know, you can exactly. trim it up or you'll, you'll meet a student who's good at video editing and they can edit it later. But if you like, and you can always record probably a better one by yourself later, but starting out, I would just say you're already demonstrating it live, have a kid record it. It's going to be a sloppy copy for a while, but to Ron's point, your sloppy co copy usually holds more value than a pro edited stranger YouTuber. Um, so you can always add the polish later, but um, starting out, save yourself time. You're already doing the live demonstration. Have a kid record it. Warehouse that for a reference. Add polish when you get a chance. Yeah. And something you can also do, Thomas, at our school, and a lot of schools have this, uh, Stag Tommy TV. Um and have their kids send their kid down to do the video and let them put together because a 
the school loves when you get cross curriculum going on. Obviously, Thomas, you know, I mean, I don't know if you know Mr. Holenstein very well, but Neil is all about doing that. It gives those kids something else to do. It's uh, one more thing off your plate. And then Ron has always talked about this. Whenever there's a camera in the classroom, the kids, uh, the kids always uh, um, seem to act a little bit better. So, <laughs> oh yeah, uh, I've been utilizing Tommy TV a lot yeah. here. So Tommy TV for everybody else is basically your local high school uh, media class. Why not utilize that? Let them make the content, you know. Uh, and then also. What Barb, um, what sorry, what uh, Bloomcast is talking about is like you can have like the most chatty, annoying, loud class, and you say, "Hey, quiet on set! I'm making a video." And you hold the camera, or have some kid hold the camera, and when some kid interrupts it, you go, Shh, "We're we're recording. We're recording." They will be quiet, and they'll be quiet like not when you ask them to be quiet, but because the camera's rolling. No idea why. It's like a magic trick. It's like a little force field. I don't know why, but they just, they respect the camera process, the process of making a video. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. Just crazy. Because they know, like, making these TikTok videos or Instagram videos or reels, you know, somebody's talking in the background, messes up their video. They know what it's like. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> um, okay, so... Make your own content. I think everybody kind of is on that. Does anybody else here want to chime in on making your own content? And then I think I got, and then I got another question. Unless you're teaching on shape, then you can use barber checks. <laughs> okay. Like Ron. Though. Wait, this is okay. So <laughs> yeah. I didn't finish. I was supposed to make content for my, for my on shape, which is, which is basically a, a new version of SolidWorks. It's basically CAD work. It's CAD. Okay. Not AutoCAD. It's three dimensional, but I didn't finish making the content and Barbacek used some of my, my, the, the order of the lessons and then he finished the content. So I was going to make content one day and I was like, wait a minute, Barbacek already did this. I'm like, hold on. So I'm like, pull it up. I'm like, that's actually pretty good. And I just used it because it's on, it's on YouTube. So I used Barbacek probably like 10 lessons. And I was like, and I, I totally can. I was like, yo, you should get to know Barber Check. It's a real good teacher. I was like, hey, what'd you think? Who do you like better? They're like, oh, yeah, Barber Check, pretty good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They don't like mine. They like Barber Check. So I gave them more. I was like, screw it. So actually, this is really just a trick to get you to make content so I could use it, <laughs> um, you know? <laughs> I don't think uh, it's working. Uh. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> So but that is funny. I enjoy that um, whole process of like you had a list of CAD and I stole your content and then I just recorded and it, it just it's just kind of funny how it came full circle. Yeah, those are good. Yeah, but that I mean, that's a good point you guys make there, though. I mean, obviously, making your own content is really good, but sometimes you find those sweet you get lucky and find those really good ones. You're like, all right, there's no need to make your own when well, I, mean, I do the same thing on a job site. I bring, I bring in professionals yeah. to yeah. show the exact same thing. So sometimes the change of face helps, um, you know, and especially you or if you team up with somebody. It. Yeah. So well, again, if, you, Matt? if you sell it with that personal connection, right? Like Ron being able to say, I know this person and I've done it the same with like some of Ron's stuff as well. Like he's got one minute video on orthographic for I'll be like, yeah, I know this guy. And they're like, and I give him a little backstory. So if you have a personal connection, Matt with his, all his architect people, um, you know, he's got all those personal connections and they know that, you know, these people, yeah, you can use their content and it is a change of face. It's kind of refreshing for them to see that adds a lot of uh, credibility to what you do when there's this other professional that they respect or your respect kind of signing off on that. There it is right there. This is him <laughs> working on the thing. And it, you know, it, it's, it's literally a donut, but it's just to get started. And he's explaining the whole thing. This was great. I used a whole bunch of these lessons. And then uh, with, uh, I'll find my one minute videos, which is so funny because I missed the TikTok thing. I guess TikTok would have been perfect at the time. <laughs> 
I make these one minute videos. I just, just nail it. And literally like what they were saying, just hand the camera over to a student. The only thing they do is they always cut off headspace. So it always looks like this. So just try and, uh, try and get them to hold it correctly uh, or get the, you know, media department. All right, let's see. Um, you know, something came up. Oh, go ahead. Someone, yeah. someone's got it. You also have the shop class podcast. You know, we're on here oh. Wednesday nights, yeah. eight o'clock, you know, jump on like if for years, this is my 25th year. You know, we used to go to conferences, the state conference, and the state conference was good for a while, you know, but attendance started diminishing and diminishing and diminishing. And you're always wondering, am I doing the right thing? You know, so Instagram popped up. You see the things on Instagram, what other teachers are doing. And then you have the shop class podcast just to verify, you know, you're going in the right direction. You're in this, you have the same, you know, uh, mindset as other shop teachers, around the countries, maybe even around the world. Yeah. Sometimes we got, we got a guy from Australia, Damien, and we got um, a few Canadians and some California, some Texas. And it's, pre it's pretty, it's been pretty wild, um, but it's true. Like we're here every week. So, um, you know, yeah, you can absolutely drop in, ask us some questions. Um, you know, and we don't always, sometimes we have teachers and sometimes we have tradespeople um on the show uh and i didn't pay duke to say that you know <laughs> uh so let's see not yet uh, yeah he, no. he'll get a free t-shirt yeah. <laughs> yeah we're gonna get t-shirts made soon yes uh, yeah that would be cool so um so the next thing that we're gonna get to is um okay so this came up and it's very similar to what's happening here um We've actually got people asking about new classes. So you guys know Al Finch. I think it's Finch or Fitch. Um, he jumps on every so often. And uh, he actually has an opportunity to create a new class. And he didn't know what exactly to do. Um, it's kind of similar to even if you've taught for a while, it's kind of similar, you know. So um, if you were to make a new class, you know, what would it be? And uh, uh, that's kind of like, like, how would you structure it? And so what I said to him was, you know, what do you want to do? And what capability do you have in that room? You know, and those are kind of like my two questions. Um, and then from there, I would say just small competitive projects. So the advice for, for, I mean, that's kind of how I do it. Um, but the advice for someone creating a new class is kind of similar to someone with an, uh, as a new teacher, but the only difference is uh, I would keep it, like Tim said, like keep it kind of conservative the first couple, first year or maybe two or whatever. Um, uh, what would you guys do? if you? What advice would you give a teacher if they were starting a new class? And the reason I ask this is to help out Al because I know he couldn't make it on, but I'll send him this episode. And maybe this will help them out. Um, so we'll go around the room. Uh, just uh, jump in, whoever wants to go first. What advice would you give, to, even to a veteran or a new teacher, if it was a new class completely? What would you say? Uh, let's start. Um, with I guess. Okay. Yeah, man, uh, Blue Quest, go ahead. Since, since, no, since no and I were literally just kind of talking about this actually today. Um, and, and I did start one new class. I started a 3D modeling class when I was teaching at the high school. Well, first of all, go for it. <laughs> uh, if you want to do it, because the thing is, the good thing with new classes, a lot of times these are your ideas. I mean, the school may approach you about a class, um, but the opportunity to really do what you want to do, it usually, because um, they, they come to you with maybe the idea at best or be like, oh, you know, you know, would this be a good class? So if it's something you really want to do, go for it. Um, but, you know, make it, this is really your chance to make it yours. And even for you guys, both of you guys, as you starting off, just starting teaching, you know, and we've talked about this already, so I'm going to deep in that, but um, yeah, make, make it, make it as fun as possible for, I don't know if anybody said it yet tonight, definitely make any of these classes as fun as possible for you yourself, because I mean, Thomas, I think, I hope, 
anyways, he felt like I always had fun in class. That was I, when I taught at the prison, I had a lot of feedback that I, I seemed like I had fun in class. So if you're having fun, the kids are going to have fun. So when it comes to new classes, hey, may, if, and if it's something you're like, I don't want to do that at all, tell your administration. I mean, they may still make you make make you do it. They have a good reason for it, but they may say, okay, all right, if you're not into it, then let's not do that. And, you know, if you have a suggestion for another class, um, but yeah, try, try to, try to keep the control of what happens in that for sure. That worked for me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's a huge career opportunity to create your own class. Basically shop teachers have that. They can tweak it. They can move it, but a creating an entirely new class with a different title and a whole different budget or machines. That's like once in a career. And you know, it's funny. I've been to, uh, probably get in trouble for saying this, but I've been to like a whole bunch of uh, uh, staff meetings and, you know, to be honest, like, I'm not sure I needed any of them. Um, if I missed them, I'm not, I think my life would be the same. That's a nice way of putting it. But anyway, there was one out of 17 years and the, the superintendent, assistant superintendent, she came in front of like 250, 250 teachers and she said, um, and she said, Hey, we're, uh, you know, I was like half asleep, you know, and she said, she said, Hey, we're going to start new classes and we've got a budget for it. Does anybody want to write a curriculum and start a new class? And I, I just, what, you know, like, wait, wait, us. And she said, yeah, I'm like right here, right here. Absolutely. We're doing it. And we did, you know, my thing was I wanted to do an electric car class and, um, you know, I, I love gasoline and everything, but come on, you know, we need, we need options. And that was in 2008. And so if you get like an option to create a new class, oh man, just think, what are they going to need in the next 10 years or 20 years, you know, make a class that like makes these kids like really strong and makes your career just like kick butt, you know, like make a kick butt topic. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to light everybody's fire. So that's a huge opportunity, uh, even if you're new or a veteran. So, so the reason I asked that is because maybe someone listening to this is a veteran. They have a, a chance, like Al, to create a new class. Man, go for it. But also, small project. Don't bite off more than you can chew. You know, a little bit of lecture, mostly working. You know, all the rules apply. <laughs> Yeah, I I'd say with a new class, like you get your tasks. I, I feel like I've been making a new class like this whole time just because with all my classes, just because I was never given the old guy's curriculum or, or an old, you know, I was ne I had nothing in both schools I taught at. It was basically a blank canvas, um, no standards, no expectations as to what I taught in both programs had access to both wood and metal and some building traits and some small engines and no one told me like what to teach. And I wish somebody probably would have, I wish somebody would have put the boundaries on. Cause I, like I, re I reached a breaking point this year where I snapped and um, part of it. And I, I had, I talked this out with the, with my boss is I was like, I, I don't know really what you guys want. And you've entrusted me to make all these decisions until it comes budget, you know, until I needed the money for it. And then all of a sudden it's a giant question mark. Well, now I have to retool all of my decision-making based off no new feedback. Like you're, you're being ambiguous. So whether it's a new class or existing class, I, I would try and peg some sort of concrete num number for your budget or make one up for yourself if you have to, and then flirt with a line. Um, but you want to, you want to have some constraints, you know, like, around the class, like uh, constraints improve performance. So let's say you're going to spend this much money or you're going to cover, you're, you're going to do um, 3D printing, but you're only going to work with one type of filament starting out. So you're not going to try, you know, I've made that mistake where, you know, I diversified myself to the point where it's like, no one's learning anything really. Cause it just, it's just messy, you know? So, so give yourself like realistic constraints if you're, if you get to make this new class. And then I would also say, because it's going to be new to you, maybe, I don't know if the content area is new. Like it seems like shop teachers are spread so thin that if you do a, 
a focused class on anything that something's going to be new to you right like um <clears throat> maybe you're a woodworker, but you haven't done wood turning and that's part of the class or, or 3d printing is new to everybody. Right. And if that becomes part of the class, then that's going to be a new learning curve. Be real with your students about that. You can get like credibility is super important when you have an audience. So you want to have credibility, but, but focus on getting your credibility from the fact that you can manage a group of adolescents around dangerous power tools and you can manage a classroom and you can be a leader. That's where you get your credibility from. And then if you have to face a learning curve, just be real. Like, don't, I used to kind of try and mask it and hide it. And, and it, students can smell it a mile away. It's disingenuine. They don't like it. It's, it's nerve wracking to kind of get in front of teenagers and be like, yeah, I've never operated this 3D printer before. I, I don't know why, you know, it's blowing a connecting rod, you know, and, and then you, and then you're problem solving in front of a live audience. Like that's a weird sensation. The first few times you do it because you won't problem solve as good as you normally do when all the eyeballs are on you and you're trying to narrate your thoughts as you do it, but just lean into it because the more you lean into it, the easier it'll be, the more, and then, um, it'll just be much more an authentic experience for you and them. Yeah, totally. It's such a cool process, but it's it's sometimes stressful. I, sometimes I do stuff on the fly. At, at, you know, like like Barbara Check was saying, like um, you're you're trying something new and it's not working, and so you on, make a change on the fly. Oh boy, that's like imagine it's almost like being a comedian. Imagine changing up your whole routine in front of the audience, and you might get heckled. You know, you got to handle that. I actually. I'm in a new mode lately. I, I literally go into it just – I don't even go up there and go – I used to go, hey, this is what we're doing. Now I go, uh, look, this is what I want to do. Does that jive? Like are you even going to do that? And then they're like, yeah, we could do this and this, but we don't know what this is. And I go, okay, let's talk about that. I want to get to the problem quicker of, of either it's a communication problem or – like I don't have time to – pretend to be a teacher anymore <laughs> you know what I mean it's just like I'm just like look you tell me and it's like I have all these kids in front of me and they're like they love just screaming out the answer they're like yeah, yeah but we don't understand this and I'm like okay okay why don't you understand that and they're like well what do you mean like what where what's six by three and I'm like that's in inches it's the length they're like well put length I'm like all right so now I wrote down like I just let them critique me I don't care anymore. I just need to get to communication faster. You know, it's like, I'm not into, it doesn't matter what I have to say. It matters, did I communicate? You know, I don't know if that makes sense. It's crazy lately. You should see what happens in my class. Oh my God. I don't even know how they, I always make the joke. I'm like, I just work here. I don't even know how, like they hired me. That's basically it, you know. <laughs> um. All right. Oh, what else do we got? Does anybody else want to talk about new classes? Is that where we're at? You got to put in content that's <clears throat> you're interested in it too. Like you can't just throw in 3D printers because 3D printers are cool and they're popular right now. Like if you're not into 3D printers, the kids will know. Like they'll read you. If you're not into it, you know, you're not going to want to teach it and don't don't teach something just for the sake of teaching it. Yeah, totally. Uh, something I did early on with that new class is I was like, oh, we're going to year one, we're going to modify a car. And we did year two. We're going to modify this other car. And we did year three. We're going to build a car from scratch. Nope. <laughs> no, that did not happen. <laughs> And the reason it didn't happen is because um, it's too much, you know, and you sort of have to hit that, hit that barrier, you know, it's too much. Also, I bought a whole bunch of tools. Uh, one of the tools we barely use, even though it was like, it's like a prize tool. It's like so cool. And then now in hindsight, I'm like, nah, we don't really need that. <laughs> you know, you need a lot of practical stuff. You don't need that specialty one of a kind tool that makes the place really cool. It's like, eh, what do you got, Duke? Here's one. All right. So running, running after school club, anything you want. 
and that's like your trial for what you're going to teach in class. You know, it might be making cutting boards. You don't know if it's going to work in class. You don't know if you can teach it. But if you run it on an after school club, it's a lot more laid back. The kids are a lot more relaxed. Administration's not going to bother you. And basically, you can do what you want, you know, with a group of kids who you can pick to try out lessons you may teach in the future. That's how I got my robots in. You know, I did a couple of robots. I had an after school program. We went to a competition. We started with like one robot, two robots. You learned about the robots like Barbacek was teaching. My old shop teacher told me you only have to be one day ahead of the kids. You know, so you can do your homework in that after school program. And then eventually, you know, I incorporated the robots into our curriculum. So it started as an after school program and then it ended up something in the curriculum. And it was also something I was into. Totally. Um, let me go back to Thomas for a sec. Thomas, I don't want to lose yet. I feel like, uh, you know, you got a lot going on. You're, you know, you're not even done with college yet and you're starting this program. Uh, you feel like you're getting something out of this. Do you have any questions for us? Uh, uh, what do you think, man? I don't. Everything's, I got, I got a nice page of oh, wow. notes for, for, I'm sure a lot of them will be used throughout the course of my career if I get the position. And I mean, you guys have covered a significant amount of what I was worried about going into it, being fresh out of college and not having, I mean, I've worked in the industry, but I haven't worked in the industry. So yeah, you guys have covered a lot of, a lot of good material. Nice. And I'm breaking my own rule. We're giving you too much information. <laughs> But I, you know, I think you're, you're, you know, you're, that's what this is about. We're having like a conversation a round table about it. Um, so I think I got written down here. Um, uh, I was, I was thinking about going into like, um, some funny stuff. So I'm like, if you got, if, if the veterans have like a bad day, but a funny one, obviously not, not too dark, not too crazy, but like a funny, bad day, like a war story that you kind of made it through. Um, I feel like that would be fun way, you know, cause, cause at towards the end of the night, these shop class podcasts, they become like campfires a little bit. I noticed that they become like a little bit less structured and more like, ah, listen, we're just hanging out talking. Um, so I, I have a war story, but I'll wait. Uh, uh, you know, does anybody here want to tell us like, give me your worst day and how you made it out of it? You know, Dude, I, feel like Dude's ready. I don't have, I don't have a war story, but teaching, Teaching shop tech ed is the worst with words. Like you got to say words like butt joint, screw, and we can go, we can go over every <laughs> word imaginable. But like, look at it. I said screw, and you get six guys in it. Girls, like, you know, they the words, the words that you know have come up in woods. Uh, so true. Spindle standards going up and down, and you know. You got to watch when you say disc sander. They're like, huh? What? (laughs) And then just (laughs) so (laughs) you're going to have to say, I have to say cock a lot. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So funny. It goes back to Timmy's whale. (laughs) Oh my. (laughs) Timmy had this hand carved whale. I died laughing. I'm worse than the kids. <laughs> and so, and then we, got, you're right. Matt is always yeah. caulking the seals. Are you kidding me? This is horrible. And it's, this is, it's, they're teenagers. I, whenever I'm writing on the board, I'm always like, does that, does that look like a dick? Oh, God damn it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Try teaching CO, CO2 cars. Like, how do you make that? Or uh, if you're teaching about fits, like here's a interference fit and a press fit and a clearance fit, and you're talking about shafts and the size of the holes, and you know, I mean, it's like I've had that lesson a couple times, and uh, uh, woo, <laughs> you gotta come really up funny. with your own words. I don't even say like s- screw in the screw. I'm like attach the screw. That doesn't even make sense, but. 
Yeah. Instead I, of saying screw it in to a bunch of middle school kids. This is too funny. Oh my God. Nick, you got anything horrible for us? <laughs> He's thinking. I, I blocked it out. Who was that? But no. <laughs> What'd you say? I said I blocked it out. Who was that? Oh, <laughs> no. Understandable. Understandable. Um, uh, Matt, you got See, any I, I mess with the horrible? kids. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, I don't really have any. I don't have any like any horror oh. stories or anything like or funny ones. I'm not. I mean, nothing. Yeah. Oh well, Thomas uh, wasn't. It, it was in the morning class. One of the kids has a chicken outfit. I was and, gonna say uh, I've seen it. He wore it. Yeah, R- Remy. Uh, uh, he 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 was doing greetings at the the school at the elementary school. They had him dressed up in this chicken outfit that he has. And he was doing greetings. Well, he wore it to the job site. And we have a nice funny picture of Raiden choking Remy, dressed up in the chicken outfit. <laughs> yep. So you can put that one together. And then uh, with the caulking, I always mess with the kids because everyone laughs and has fun with it anyway. So I'm like, all right, who's going to be the commander of the caulk? And <laughs> who's the best caulker? So, I mean, you, you got to roll with it. Like, they're high school kids. Yeah. They laugh. They they're gonna make a joke of it, so you might as well joke, joke along with them. You know, yeah. so it's I, yeah. Thomas's group was they, they're always entertaining. There's they, they're they're a fun group. So there's probably stuff that I, I I joke around with them more now that they're graduating. Um, but that you can joke around quite as much with them as students. But yeah, it was fun. It it like we all said, it's shop class. It's you can't get around it. He's, it's good. It's good. Good to laugh. I don't know if he still has it or not, but whenever, whenever my junior year, I started working with Matt on the side, doing like he had side projects I helped him with after school, and I know that after school Matt was a lot more cooler than. I mean, in in school Matt was cool, but out of school Matt was pretty cool, and. um I remember one time we were hanging, hanging a pantry door, not really a pantry, like a linen closet inside of a bathroom. And he had me go on the inside to uh, nail it in from the inside. And naturally, whenever I walk out with the nailer, he has a video camera in my face saying I'm coming out of the closet and all kinds of good stuff going on and, and the, the client is there. So I can't, can't cuss him out. <laughs> I just kind of have to roll with it. That's good, man. That's good. It's so funny. Yeah. You could be cool as long as, you know, yeah. I mean, look, it, you can't avoid it. It's sometimes things come up off, you know, with electronics, there's male and female ends. We got to put them together. You know, and then the kids like, ha, ha, ha. I'm like, I get it. Yeah, I know that this is funny. You just say it. Look, you just say, look, I, I understand this is funny. But this is what they call it, you know. <laughs> you know, it's literally called male and female ends, you know. Um, this and is for us, Ron, we have, uh, we have boards that are tongue and grooved. So, oh yeah, yeah, you can just imagine how that all is. It's just it, part of it. It's it, one of the joys. <laughs> You just yeah, got you dude, know, great you to go back to our high school roots. <laughs> That's so funny. high school mentality. That's really funny. Um, I you know, so I have a first day horror story. It wasn't my first day, but it was like, um, uh, you know, kind of like you know, I think it's got to be a little bit scary walking into a classroom, uh, especially if you if you're new, if you're like still kind of like close to the high school. Or you haven't been in a high school in a while, um, so I, I I was in the classroom, I you know, and I was lecturing way too much, like I was giving all the information about how engines work, and and I'm like, and I studied the night before, I fell asleep with the book, you know, I was like really into it, you know, you like you're nervous, you're like oh my god, they gotta have all this information, and I'm doing this, and I'm on the board, and all of a sudden. A uh, piece of paper gets thrown at the board, you know, like crumbled up, spitball-y kind of paper. Bam! And I'm like, I turn around, and I'm, at the time, I was like 26 or 27. And so half of me is like, 
you know, like, I'm like, who fuck did that, you know? But I didn't say that. In my head, I was like, okay, I can't say that. So I didn't know what to say. So my brain just went, um, don't throw paper like that. That was my response, which was the worst response. So I'm like, okay. So I turn around and I go to draw some more. And now it's like rapid fire. Every kid in the class is throwing paper at me. It's my nightmare. They're totally heckling me. It's off the chart. There's just no respect at all, you know? So I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, all right. And you never be want to be the guy who gives the tension. Like, I haven't given the tension in probably a decade. But at the time, yeah, you just, that's so stupid. Handle it yourself, you know? But in the beginning, you might need some backup. So I was like, um, I was like, all right, that's it. I'm writing up. I'm writing up who did. I think it's these five guys. Right. And they're like, nah, nah, nah. You know, they're like yelling at me because it's like an urban neighborhood. So it was kind of wild back then. Now it's totally different. I have like all these AP kids now. But anyway, so they're like, they're like, nah, nah. And I was like, yep, yep, yep. And I'm writing it down. I'm writing it down. And I got five. And they're like, I'm like, oh, you don't like that? And they're like, no. I'm like, all right, I'll just rip these up if you just tell me who did it. And I thought, no way are they going to give up the kid. All of a sudden, all these arrows just went to this kid. They, they just gave him up. They just gave him away. And I was like, it, it made me laugh. And I was like, okay, sh- 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 here you go. And he's laughing. He took it, proudly took the ticket, and walked to the office. And the kids were laughing. We had a good time. You know, so you got to have some fun, even if you have a bad day, I would say. Uh, you guys have any, you guys have any, uh, first day stories, any, any stuff like that? They're all like, dude, we didn't take as much. Oh, I, that reminds me, Ron. I, t- I totally forgot. I did have a kid put a penny in between two power cords and blow the crap out of everything. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. That's so scary. Oh my God. And it wasn't 110. It was 220. It was big. It was big ones. Whoa. Yeah. And, and the Whoa. kids turned. I was going to send the whole group down to the office, and they turned right away on who it was, which I knew who it was, but I forgot about that. <laughs> oh, and then the flip side of like you know being you know classroom management is it was a kid who stole something out of the room, kind of like he thought it would look like brass knuckles. It was like a piece of metal that went around it, and. I, I like lost my mind because I was like, I was so mad that he did that. But I was in a different place. I totally, I was a young teacher. I didn't know what was going on. So I remember I learned a very valuable lesson. The principal who handled the discipline had me and the student and the principal, you know, in a room. And they were like, you know, where did you get this from? And how come you took it from the room? Blah, blah. And I was mad. I was like, wow, he could have hurt someone and da, da, da. And the kid uh, wouldn't say anything. Like, he was trying to hold his ground. That's what I thought. But he actually was started to cry. And the principal just went, you know what? We're done here. You know, we're done here. And he let the kid go. And he's like, hey, man, you know, this kid, it's just a kid. You know, like, I know you, he stole a piece of steel from your room that could have been very dangerous. But he's just a kid, you know. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And he's like, yeah, just take it easy. I was like, oh, man. So I, and that guy taught me a really good lesson. You know, you got to keep it in perspective. They're just kids. You know, they're going to do dumb shit. You know. <laughs> um, man, we covered a lot. This is a lot. A lot of, All right. a lot of times, too, if you think a kid stole something, they probably didn't. It'll show up somewhere. 100% correct. Yep. Oh, and same with, like, I've been there 17 years. I've only had maybe two or three things taken from the room. And I got to tell you, most of the time I just misplaced it or somebody else misplaced it. Don't go to extremes. It's not, People aren't, especially a shop class, they like it. They like shop class. They're not trying to, like, ruin the room. Uh, I mean, you should lock stuff up, and I try. I always turn yeah, off the power. Yeah, don't leave too um, much stuff out either. But yeah, like obvious stuff, knives and stuff. That's all away. Power tools, turn them off or lock them up. You know, 
Um, the the kids will be the issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. You never know. You never know. It'll well. I mean, it'll be other adults. It could be. It could be staff. Other teachers. Yeah. Although one time I have a weird story. Like one time I I kept I used to keep a guitar at the school. I know it sounds funny, but like you know, you gotta have your days where you just kind of like rip on a guitar for the kids. It's just fun. Um, but I kept it there and I didn't lock it and it was, and it, um, it disappeared. And I really thought, it, I, th- I really thought it was this one maintenance guy. And kind of, I asked him without, you never accuse someone. You just kind of ask. And I asked and he said, no. And I was like, I was like, okay. Hmm. And about a year or two went by and a couple years went by. And then about, about five or six years went by and I got a call on my birthday from a for- former student. Cause we became friends. He's a, like a guitar guy. He calls me and he says, hey, man, remember that guitar? I was like, yeah. He's like, I stole that. I was like, wait, what? You stole my guitar? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, dude, you owe me a guitar. He's like, don't worry. I got you. I got you. He's like, I was desperate at the time. I feel bad about it. I was like, yeah, clearly you, you, you weren't even on the radar and you gave it up. You know, like it, it'll eat someone alive. They're not going to steal from you. It, it'll, it'll kill them to steal from you. Um, so you never know who's going to be. So, you know, be, don't go accusing anybody. Not that you would. I, uh, you know, I'm just saying my story. Um, we covered a lot and we're getting close to the 10 o'clock mark. Um, this is a good episode. Uh, is there, is there anything else anybody wants to, uh, I have one more question, but is there anything anybody wants to add to this or a question? All right. Um, so one other thing I would, I would ask is like, Hey, if, if for the veterans, if you were going to like redo a year, uh, or like what advice would you give yourself? Uh, you know, so like that's maybe pretty deep. We're getting some echo here. Let's see. Uh, you see, it might be yours. No, no, this it is. Oh, it might be your, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. No, there was, you were getting an echo over there. Um, you can unmute anytime you want. Uh, anybody want to talk about, like, we'll just go around. This will be quick, kind of round up and we'll be done. Um, is, uh, what advice would you give yourself? Like now that, you know, you know, now you've been teaching, uh, who wants to go first here? Don't, uh, don't take things to heart. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get to every single kid. When you first start teaching, you think you're gonna change the lives out of every single kid. You only see the kids for a marking period, but you think they're gonna change your lives. Then they do something stupid. They bring something stupid into school, and you take it to heart. You know, ah, it's my fault. I was, I was getting to that kid. But you know, take two, three, four kids under your wing per school year. You know, and try to make it difference in those lives because you're not going to get to every single kid and every single kid's not going to love your class even though you love your class and you think they should too they're not gonna just try to give them the best experience you can while they're there you know make it fun for them that that helps hey nice and to add to duke's thing you may real like i've had students say stuff to me that they like I didn't realize they got to them and they told me like after they graduated. So yeah, that's a good advice, Duke. That's why I want to come up with that award. We'll talk about that some other time. Okay. I I would say uh, go home, <laughs> go home. Cause I used to put in such long hours and burn myself like I, I was on the threshold of like burning myself out completely from this profession um to the point of like publicly yelling at adults in the building and just walking I've never walked off a job site I walked off this year um and um through that kind of like that led to a transformation where I was like I gotta set boundaries on my time and my constraints and my ability and and then I started sticking to like contract hours. I was like, screw it. You know, if, if, if this is what they've agreed to pay me for anything I do outside of that's unpaid and volunteer work. And, um, what I like told myself is like, no, I want to be a good uncle. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good dog father just as much as I want to be a good teacher. 
And it's not fair to those other roles that I have. And here's the crazy part. Since I've kind of adopted this better perspective about like, like work is meant to support my home life, you know, so I should enjoy my home life. Like I've gotten so much more productive. My teaching has gotten so much more efficient. Like my uh, performance has gone, like I, I feel like I've gone three notches up better as a teacher just because I'm more authentic with my students. I make decisions like that because because I, I've i decided like I'm going home. You know what I mean? I am not working late. So I don't waste time him and Han because in my head I know, hey, I'm going to be home when contract hours end. Um, and I still, don't get me wrong, I still dabble, you know what I mean, in things here and there if they pique my interest and they really, but um, it felt like settle, settling for mediocrity at first. And, and I kind of came to terms with that. I was like, I'm just going to be a mediocre teacher from here on out. I'm pissed. I'm pissed at the world. And I'm tired of giving the world this five-star performance if the world's not going to give me much back at all. And so I was like, I'm, fuck it. I'll settle for medio mediocrity. And in doing so, I'm pretty sure I've unlocked like the best teaching performance that I'm capable of. Um, very counterintuitive, very strange sensation. But that's the first thing I would go back, tell my younger self. I'd grab him by the shoulder and say, just, hey, go home. Nice. Wow. That's that must awesome. be really, really, really slow because after 20 years, I'd still stay late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, go home. It'll make you a better teacher. I'm telling you, it's it's felt counterintuitive this whole time. and But it's I can't deny it. It just has made me such a better teacher. Nick's still at school. Look at him. Yeah. <laughs> And buy a beanie. Half the teachers on this have beanies on. <laughs> oh, we got to get a shop class. These ones are freezing. <laughs> I know. Um, cool. Uh, I think I would say um, to my younger self, uh, two things. Uh, everything goes in chapters. So, like, if, if you're going to go all in, like, I basically, I never left the high school like I was just there all the time we had a room in the shop that we had like a mini fridge and whatnot the kids would just hang out I have peanut butter like I would provide food so we could work on cars and whatnot I had an after school program that just kept going and I just never left and that was good for a chapter um, <clears throat> but at some point the result of that was all these grants and, and money that came in and expanding the program. And I think I started diversifying a lot. Like I started buying a lot of stuff. You know, you got to kind of like um, uh, keep it simple, you know, expand the program in increments. I would say, you know, chapters and increments. Uh, and then, and then absolutely don't take it to heart. One, I, I got to steal that from Duke. That, that's probably more important than anything else. Um, and 100% got to put another check on what BloomQuest said, which is, yeah, you just don't know. The impact is huge. When you're like, man, I've had, I've had students tell me just like the same thing. Say, you know what, you know, what you said to me changed the course of my life or what you did in that class or whatever. And I'm like, really? What? I had no idea. So you, you absolutely do have an impact. Um, so I agree. And uh and and Barbara checks right, you gotta take a break. Like I used to never take a day off. That's not good. <laughs> you gotta take a day off. You got to take a day off and you got to do something fun uh do a ferris bueller day but also do some professional days yeah there is a point where you might be giving the school too much and if you give the school too much you're going to get frustrated when you don't see progress happening at the pace you're moving well but that's because everybody else is home and you're still at the school <laughs> you know like yeah it, it's a government operation it's it is what it is you know um, so it's, I mean, it's pretty lucky how far all of us have gotten, um, you know, some teachers 
they're not going to make it any not their program's not going to advance so they have to leave the school or slow down um so you know th this is great advice this is a great one i try not to take work home i might be at school till 11 o'clock at night doing the work but um, i don't like doing the work at home yeah that's that's a new one i've been doing that over the last maybe five years i i will not do paperwork at home i'm not sitting on a sunday night doing grades it's not happening no way that's happening at school and sometimes i'll just do it in class uh if the kids are busy i'm just yeah, i'm doing the grades right there i am not going home and wasting a sunday like no way no that's just it. it. If you hold yourself to those constraints, you'll get more creative with coming up with more efficient systems that you could have been doing this whole time. And sure, maybe they're not up to, again, the caliber of your imagination or the caliber of what you think the expectations are of the taxpayer or the expectations of the boss. But the fact of the matter is, if they want to get more out of you, they can put more into you. They can invest. They can get you an extra prep period if, the, if, if you need it. They can get you better grading software if that's what's slowing you down on grading like they can like there's a habit of like the teacher's responsible and the blame for everything but i mean you can if you'll take license to contract you're all, you're gonna hold yourself accountable no matter what so take license to contract out like oh my grading isn't as good as i want it to be take license to contract that blame out to the fact that they didn't give you enough time in the day to accurately provide feedback you know, that's on them, not on you. Yeah, totally. Cool. This was like amazing. Oh my God. Um, we've done one more of these uh, uh, before. We did a, uh, I think it was after after uh, Kevin Witt's first year teaching. That's I think that's episode seven back when it was uh, Barbara Check and I doing it. Um, it's all on Spotify now and it's on YouTube as well. Uh, so you can dig back in the episodes and, uh, yeah, that's cool. So we'll probably end it there. Um, and then we usually just hang out for a bit, make fun of each other and, uh, finally hit the, hit the sack. So, all right. Uh, shop class podcast. And uh, I'm going to stop the recording there. See you guys.